meeting you right where you are on your foster care journey. This is The Forgotten Podcast. Hello and welcome to The Forgotten Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Cabe, and I am so happy to be with you. If you are part of the foster care community, passionate about serving, or simply interested in learning more, we are here for you. In every episode of this podcast, you will hear stories from men and women who have experienced foster care to one degree or another. They may have grown up in the system, are caseworkers, foster parents, or others who are here to bring you hope or encouragement. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe and share it with a friend. And remember, you are not alone. I hope you enjoy the Forgotten Podcast. Carrie and Jesse, I'm so very happy to be able to talk with you guys. I know that you both have spoken with each other before. However, today, or yesterday rather, was the very first time you met in person. That's correct. Yeah, I had Jesse on my podcast, which is Carrie O'Toole Ministries on YouTube. Um, we were deciding, what was it, about six years ago? Something about that, yeah. Yeah, and we had a really amazing interview then, and go back and watch it, it's incredible. And then we did it again as kind of a follow-up maybe two and a half years ago. Yeah. And um, so we, and we've talked on the phone a few times here and there, but we had never met. Mm. So yesterday was the first time we got to meet in person, and now we've had a couple of meals together. And That's cool. Yeah, really neat. Yeah, it was pretty special. I've been waiting to meet her for a while, and I really connected with you when we first did the podcast, which was, you'll come to find out, is rare in my situation. Uh, but she's been a wonderful person, and I encourage you know whoever's watching or listening to uh, check her out. She's really somebody special. So glad we got to meet, my, uh, finally meet yesterday. It was a true blessing for that. That's awesome. Well, I want us to start with giving a little bit of context. Um, so Carrie, you're a wife, an adoptive mom, and you're a coach now to families who are struggling in their adoption journey. And as we'll hear today, because you've gone through your share of struggles in the adoption journey. Right. I'm also a biological mom, just yes. to let you know. But yes, I'm an international adoptive mom as well as a domestic adoptive mom. I'm also a relinquishing mom after eight years mm -hmm. of parenting. So um, different story there. But yeah, then I went back to graduate school after all of this, and we'll share a little bit more. But um, got my degree in counseling and started a coaching ministry to help other families because we just were finding there was nothing out there and nobody really understood the severity of some of the issues that we were dealing with. And so I started a ministry to help other families with their own grief and trauma that have come from parenting traumatized children. Yeah. Wow. I'm so thankful that you have and that you're doing that. Um, Jesse, what, tell us a little bit of context about you for everyone who's listening. Well, there's a lot to it, but we'll go into that uh, later. Um, pretty much I was <clears throat> a product of a single alcoholic mother. Uh, was very abusive, very neglect, a lot of neglect. Um, was uh, fostered and then adopted later on. Um, well, I was born with fetal alcohol syndrome as well as hydrocephalus, which is a brain condition. And as I got older because of the neglect and abuse that was suffered, I developed uh, reactive attachment disorder. Um, was placed into children's shelter, group homes, um, and then eventually overcame that and working to help others you know, do the same. So that's kind of in a nutshell, yeah. a little bit about it. Yeah, and we'll dig into your story a little bit more. Um, but I do want to ask both of you, what is something that you just love? Like, what, what gives you energy? What's your favorite thing to do? Well, I have an almost three-year-old grandchild, granddaughter. <laughs> and after having parented two kids with RAD, and one who just could not receive love or give love or any of that. Having a biological granddaughter who, like I'm the world to her. <laughs> when I drive up, I can see her just, Nanny! She's so <laughs> excited to see me, and it's such redemption, and it's just amazing. So right now, I'm loving being Nanny. Love it. What about you, Jesse? 
Something that gives me joy. Uh, <laughs> thanks, sorry. Um, you know, I just became a grandfather myself. I'm only 42, um, which to me is kind of cool because I'll be able to watch my grandkids uh, grow up. But hmm. uh, So that's a big joy. Uh, prior to that, though, it has to be playing my guitar. I enjoy music, self-taught to play guitar. I can play almost 15 different instruments, uh, self-taught. But wow. guitar is my favorite. That's how I speak. That's my language. That's how I tell my story and how I'm feeling is through music. Mm. So I really enjoy that. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, something that you both shared with me when we talked before was that, and you guys will find that here as we talk, but you love and care for each other, appreciate each other very much. And when you hear Jesse talk, it triggers something in you a little bit. And the same for you, right, Jesse? Correct. That Can is correct. Can you speak yeah. more to that? Um, so you'll hear more about Carrie's story, obviously, um, but coming as a child's perspective, going through the system and feeling like everywhere I went, people just gave up on me and didn't truly understand what I was going through or how I felt when, excuse me, it's okay. when I hear opposite sides, um, I'm just like, you know, it hurts because I... I want the families to understand what the kids go through um, and kind of, and that's why I'm doing this is to try to give a different perspective so they can hopefully see through not only my eyes, but their children who maybe they fostered or adopted and see the different perspective and hopefully give them tools because a lot of what I hear and I don't, I don't put down the parents because, you know, I understand. I, I did the same thing to my mom and dad, so I, I understand the feelings behind it. But it hurts that they're not getting the support that they should be getting. It hurts that they're not getting um, the tools needed to deal with these children like they should be getting. So that's what triggers in me when I hear that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the mom who placed my child, mm. and he's the child. Mm. And I wish I could have done more. But we did everything we knew, and we were falling apart. But I know that even hearing, having him here, he sat in on my session earlier today, and I'm so conscious of Jesse being there and his feelings and, um, He's actually helped me know how to better speak about my son, but um, yeah, it's just, it's just hard. This is such a unique thing, and I don't know if you guys realize this, but this has never been done. I mean, here we have a, a child who went through the system and was adopted and had reactive attachment disorder and had to be placed outside his home, and here I am, a mom who adopted a child with reactive attachment disorder and over the years ended up having to place my son outside the home, and here we are sitting together, and uh, it's, to me, it's, it's truly God's redemption and his miracle that we can even be here, even though it's a little triggering. So I just want to acknowledge that and thank you both for being willing to step in the uncomfortable for the sake of others. So I thank you for that. Uh, Jesse, let's move into your story a little bit more. So let's start in the beginning. Talk about your young childhood prior to being placed into foster care. Like just give us kind of a, help us understand what it was like. Sure. So. Um, like I said, I'm 42. I was born in 1980, uh, Modesto, California, um, to a single alcoholic, drug addict, drug addict mother. She was very young. I think when she had me, she was 22. I have older siblings. Mm. Uh, very unstable, constant, different men coming in and out of the house. Um, there, we moved from apartment to apartment to apartment because she could never hold down a job to be able to pay the rent, pay the bills. Lived in cars, lived underneath bridges. A very unstable, um, inconsistent place. And now if you can picture my mother, she's Sicilian, 5'11", maybe 130 pounds, very skinny. That's where I get my height and everything from. Um, so naturally, men would come in, in and out, do what they had to do. 
Um, I witnessed sexual abuse. I witnessed my sister being thrown up against the wall, causing her arm and leg to break. Um, my sister and I were left alone many, many times at nighttime by my mom and who went out and did who knows what. My sister was my mother. She was my caretaker. Um, she was the person who always looked out for me. Um, and mind you, um, I had hydrocephalus, so I'd also had three uh, brain surgeries at the time to uh, place a VP shunt in. And even after I got home, we were left alone. Um, so it was very inconsistent, very unstable. Um, and then when we'd fend for ourselves for food or whatever, of course, we're, uh, you know, at the time I was my first, my first memory, uh, three years old. Um, and my sister is almost two years older than me. So we would make messes, a five-year-old and a three-year-old. I mean, come on, we make messes, right. right? Mom would come home and see the mess and the boyfriend, whichever boyfriend it was at the time, would take out the belt and go to town, you know? And, and I would run and hide underneath the sink. I was small enough at the time, close the doors. My sister would hide under the table. No matter where we went, we'd be found beat, mm. literally beat to blood coming out. Um, it was just absolutely horrible. And, and one of the questions I always get asked is, how come nobody stepped in? People knew it was going on. Yeah, they did, but they didn't want to say anything, a lot of family. Um, and CPS at the time, uh, for whatever reason, I know there were reports made, I don't know the whole story, uh, but we never got taken out of the home um, until about five, I was five years old at that point. I think the straw that broke the camel's back on that was I was staying with uh, my mother's mother, so my grandmother, um, and she was really no different, and I can look back now and see where my mother's behaviors came from. Um, I was asked to clean the bathtub, five years old. What do I know about cleaning a bathtub? Didn't do it right. My grandmother slammed my head on the bathroom tub. It actually split my head open. I had blood coming down. Was made to sit in a chair, screaming my, my uh, eyes out. Um, and at that point, uh, I think my grandfather, um, at the time, he was different than my grandmother was. Um, and shortly after, we were taken out of the home after that. So it was it, from birth to about five years old, it was constant chaos. Mm. Yeah. My goodness. <clears throat> I, I am so sorry. I hate that. I hate that for you. It's not right. Yeah. Your sister, yes, she was only two years older than you, and you were taken out of the home. Were you split up immediately? Uh, so when we were taken out of the home, we went to a uh, children's shelter in San Jose, California. And I remember the children's shelter, it was round, completely round, um, and you'd go in and it would have dormitory doors all the way around, mm. okay? And you walk down and there was a receiving desk right in the front and then you'd walk down and there was a pool table, there was some benches and, and whatnot. Now we had no idea why we were going there. Okay, no idea whatsoever. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So my sister and I are sitting down there and I vividly remember my sister listening to a yellow Walkman. Now for those who are younger, <laughs> a Walkman is what you use to play cassette tapes in the day. Now we have CDs and everything else. And what are cassette whatever. tapes? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. So she was listening to that and she was crying uncontrollably, um, I remember. And my mother, I saw my mother up at the desk looking at us crying uncontrollably and then she, she was gone and we were there. And we didn't understand why. Now you have to understand, your, uh, you know, some questions I get asked, well, all the abuse you went through and all the neglect, why did you care? Well, because she was my mother and that's all I knew. I didn't know any better than that. Okay, so that's one thing I want people to understand is when kids go through this, um, they don't know any difference, so that's normal to them, okay? So when my mother left, um, later on that day, another lady had come, and that's when both uh, my sister and I went into foster care, where we spent, uh, I don't know, two months in foster care. Um, and then one day my sister was gone, and then I was left behind, mm. so yeah. And do you remember, was there any explanation? Was there any, like, you didn't know she was leaving, she was just gone? Just gone, nobody told me anything, and that killed me hmm. internally, because that... Hmm. 
That was my mother to me. Yeah. My sister. Didn't know why she was gone. Um, nobody told me anything. I remember that. It was very hard. Very hard. And then a couple days after that, uh, this man and woman came. No idea who they were. And took me into another room. And we were playing cards. And then they left. Again, nobody told me anything. Well, then they came back and I went to visit their house and stayed the night. I'll never forget the first night I stayed the night. Um, I, at this time, still was not potty trained. I was five years old and I'd wet the bed and I freaked out, mm. absolutely freaked out. I thought I was gonna get beat. I hit it, I threw stuff over it, nothing. The, the gentleman in the morning asked me how I was doing, I was fine, left the room. Well, he found out, told me to come here, and I'll never forget. He said, it's okay. Mm. Dad didn't have to be afraid. And uh, that would be the foster family that I would stay with who would later adopt me when I was seven years old. Mm. And they were all alone. There was no other kids there. It was just quiet. And I'll tell you, going from chaos to quiet was a trigger. Mm. And that would come later on, though. Wow. Going to chaos to quiet was yeah, a trigger. Big time. Talk about that more, actually. When you're used to chaos, when a child's used to chaos, from, you know, from, from birth to age five, or like a sponge, right? and you absorb all this information, you learn how to love and you learn how to trust and you learn that, you know, if you cry, you're gonna get picked up and you learn if you're hungry, you're gonna get fed and you learn love and respect and you learn that you have shelter and that you're gonna be safe and you don't have any of that. Instead, you learn all this chaos. And then you go to this quiet place when all you know is chaos, it freaks you out. Because you're, you're expecting something to happen. You're expecting something to always happen. You're expecting loud noise. You're expecting yelling. You're expecting abuse, whether it be verbal or physical. You're expecting all that. Hmm. And then not to have my sister there as well. I was literally the only one there. We had a cat, but that was it, you know. But it was very eerie, very calm, very quiet. I couldn't sleep. Hmm. I had to have that chaos and noise to be able to sleep. And that first night I stayed there, I think I didn't fall asleep for three or four hours. But they finally understood what was going on, so they put a little radio in there and put it on white noise in there, so there's something mm. that would help me relax and, and calm down. Because yeah. you were always in this self-protection mode, 100%. probably. 100%. Yeah. Wow. So, Things kind of started to go, not go so well in that home, right? right? Because, and maybe just share a little bit of what age seven, when you were adopted to age 12, so, looked like. Let's back up a little bit. 1985, after I was placed into foster care, I actually, <clears throat> excuse me, we moved to England uh, for two years, and that's where I learned to read. and. And I went to school in England and developed an English accent. Hmm. Um, to this day, my parents are like, oh, we can't, you know, we always remember that it was the cutest thing or whatever. But we had moved to England, which um, I didn't understand um, because I was still waiting for my mom to come back and get me, right? And I was like, well, if we go to England, how's she gonna come back and get me? And I was, you know, fighting tooth and nail, screaming, yelling, everything trying not to go. Well, anyway, we ended up going to England. And a couple of things happened um, in England. And I know I've talked to a lot of families who have kids suffering with reactive attachment disorder or fetal alcohol. And they gravitate towards one member of the family and they push away another member of the family. And most of the times they gravitate towards the men and they push away the women. Such was the same in my case. And, and while I was in England, that started to happen. So because I didn't have a, a father figure in the picture from birth to age five, 
um, I gravitated towards this foster man and developed not a trusting relationship with him, but um, kind of a, uh, I was good when he was around, but when he was gone, I was a terror to the woman hmm. foster mom. And that's what started to happen in England because again, I had a mom, I was upset that this one made me come over here to where my mother couldn't get me, okay? So after we got back from England, about 1987, um, my foster mom says, uh, Jess, guess what? I'm like, what? It goes, uh, Lorraine's coming to see you, and that's my biological mother. Mm -hmm. I was so excited. I'm like, yes, uh, she's coming back. I'm going to go back home. Um, couldn't wait. I gathered everything I had, put it in a couple bags, put it right in front of the front door, and I sat there. And I waited, must have been a couple hours, for her to come to that door. Afternoon came, nothing. Nighttime came, nothing. She never showed up. If you can imagine a thief breaking into your home and ransacking every single room to find something and the utter chaos that he leaves behind, that's what my house looked like that night. I was so angry. Um, and this would happen multiple times until they got wise enough to not even tell me that she said she was coming because what, what would happen is she would call drunk and say she was coming, never come, and then when she was confronted about it, couldn't remember that she even did it. So they stopped all that, all that nonsense. Um, towards the end of 1987, uh, they told me pretty much that my mother was not coming back and how would I feel about being adopted by them. And I knew what adoption was. We had talked about it. And I just shrugged my shoulders. I'm like, okay, sure. It didn't hit me to the full extent what that meant. Um, but I said, okay, sure. And so in 1987, they signed the paperwork and I was officially adopted by that family. Come 1988, all the way till about 1991, we would go to Europe every year. We went safari in Africa. We got, that was our summer vacations. We traveled all over the world. She was an overseas tour guide, travel agent. My dad had worked for IBM. Um, so our, that's our summer vacations. I didn't like it, you know, but they gave me guilt trips to be able to, you know, go with them. There are times I stayed behind and they had to pay for a babysitter and that's when I would skip school and do whatever else it is I wanted. But the point is, after I was adopted, then the behaviors really started coming out, okay? It started with simple lying uh, about stupid stuff, you know? And one thing about kids with reactive attachment disorders, we believe everything we say, lie or not. And we're gonna lie, lie, lie until you believe it too. We can have a red balloon in our hand. Somebody says that's red, I'm like, no, it's blue. That's how bad it was. <clears throat> so we started lying about that. Um, and then the lying got into stealing. I had no social skills whatsoever in school. Didn't make friends, was a loner, very much an introvert. Um, didn't know how to make friends, picked on all the time, all the time. I didn't have basic hygiene skills. I was finally fully potty trained by eight years old, okay? Um, so there was times I'd go to school and have accidents and wouldn't tell anybody. And there were times when I'd purposely have accidents to keep people away because I didn't want anybody to get close to me. Um, so that went on and I would start stealing food out of lunches. Food was a big thing. Um, again, this all stemmed from birth to age five, being left alone, fending for ourselves. So that mindset carried over into my elementary school years. I didn't know how to ask help. I didn't know how to tell people how I was feeling. That was gone. My mind frame is I'm gonna get whatever I want in any means, how I'm gonna get it. You had to control it. the situation. 100%. Right, because no one else would have. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, so stealing to lying to 
about age 10, 10 and a half, uh, I kind of started having a fascination with knives and guns and fire. I started setting stuff on fire. I started collecting knives and stealing knives. About age 11, I started, or uh, about 10 and a half, 11, right about there, started self-harm, cutting myself because of the anger. Um, then I started animal cruelty. We had a cat, you know, and I apologize for saying this, but I want you guys to really understand what was going on in my, uh, in my mind at the time. Now, I'm a 100% animal lover. I truly am. But at that time, um, I had a lot of anger and I tried killing my cat. I tried killing the neighbor's cat. I tried all these things. Just the anger was boiling and boiling and boiling and boiling. I ran away from home. I would start spreading lies about my parents. I was sleeping with knives under my pillow. And then one night I'd had enough and I had made a plan. I was gonna kill my parents while they were sleeping with the knife that was underneath my pillow. Well, it just so happened that the plan I had written down everything on that I thought I could hide, they found. And they called up my social worker, and when I came, by the time I came home from school that day, all the doors were locked. Mm. My dad was outside. He says, uh, follow me, and he takes me, <clears throat> excuse me, takes me around to the side of the house, and out back was a tent, a porta potty, and ice chest full of food, and says, this is your home now. Uh, we can't have you inside the house. We can't trust you or anything like that. Okay, cool. Because I love to camp. I was like, awesome. I can come and go as I want. I can do what I want. I don't have to go to school or anything like that. Um, so I was kind of like, yeah, okay, that was cool. That's what I told him. But inside, it hurt because, again, here I am being tossed out by another person that's in my life because um, they don't understand where I'm coming from. I can't tell them where I'm coming from. I don't know how to tell them where I'm coming from other than the anger that I'm showing is the result of what I'm feeling inside. And so shortly after, you know, my dad comes out after, I think, two days. My dad comes out and says, come with us. Um, and he puts me in the car and we start driving. And we come to this building that I instantly recognize and it was a children's shelter that my sister and I had gone to when, when we were five years old. And uh, he says, uh, you're going to go here. We can't have you back at home. Um, and then you're going to go into a program for about six months to where you can get some help. Okay, cool. You know, they didn't phase me. I, at this point, um, I didn't want to be back there with them. It just, I wanted life on my own terms, and that just wasn't it. So I went to this children's shelter, stayed there for about three months. Um, and then after about three months, I uh, was sent to a level 14 residential treatment facility for boys and girls, not in the same home, but it was for boys and girls uh, in a place in Redding, California. And level 14, if you're not aware, is a place where they can physically restrain you if you are a danger to yourself or others. And I was ultimately there for two years. Um, first six months I was there, well, first month or so I was there, I had everybody fooled and like, why are you here? You don't need to be here. Um, and then they quickly figured out after about four months of being there why I needed to be there. And I think within about seven or eight months of being there, they thought I was gonna fail the program. Um, next stop for me at that point they were discussing was either Juvenile Hall or CYA, which is California Youth Authority, which is like a prison for kids. Mm. Two years later, I ended up graduating that program. I ended up graduating um, middle school from straight F's to straight A's on my report card. Got out of that residential treatment facility when I was about 16. Found out I had another sister um, who was a fraternal twin sister to the one I had sort of grown up with. Um, got to meet her for the first time. Um, and both sisters and I went to Disneyland for the first time and we got to hang out. So it was nice to know I had other, you know, family out there. Still had anger. Called my parents. Says, I'm graduating. Can't wait to come home. And they told me, well, we just don't want you home. And that hurt because I had worked so hard to change who I was um, and try to become a better person. 
And here they are just abandoning me again. Now I could have flipped out and I could have destroyed things, but I had learned so much in that two years I was in that group home. Yeah, I slammed down the phone and it hurt, but I was able to just go take a walk, talk to the counselor after, um, and that's as far as it got. And I ended up going down to live in uh, Moore Park, California, which is kind of near Los Angeles um, with my sister. Um, that didn't work out down there because, again, 16 years old, all I knew about L.A. was gang members. And I was like, mm. I didn't want to be near that. So ended up going to live in Central California, a place called Turlock, California, with my other sister. Mm. Well, at that time, then I find out I have another brother. So I got to meet my biological brother. I was the youngest, by the way, out of all of them. I'm like, wow, this is really cool. I'm finding out I have this family. So I lived there and then about 18 years old, I get out on my own, um, meet this girl, blonde hair, blue eyed girl. We ended up having a son together. Um, and then she, I still had anger issues. I still had, um, Control issues, not bad, but I was still in the mind frame. I was 19 when I had my son. Um, still in the mind frame, I work, you get up with him. Don't ask me to take care of him, okay? That created a lot of tension, and she was still kind of immature. I think I, I got with her because I found somebody who was interested in me, and that made me feel good. I didn't get with her for the right reasons. I just got with her at the instinct of, wow, she makes me feel good inside. Yep, yeah, she's the one. And so... She ended up taking off with him for a mini break because the, our relationship started to get really dangerous. She ended up not coming back. Uh, and that put me in a big, deep, deep, deep depression where I tried committing suicide three times. Um, that didn't succeed, so I'm like, okay, well, what now? So then I meet this other girl. This time I knew I'd take it slower. <laughs> Um, I was working at a security company. This was back in 2000. And we took it slower. And uh, we ended up, <clears throat> excuse me, ended up in 2001, September 2001, giving birth to a girl. <laughs> um, so my second child. And then I was working as a security uh, a guard with this company at a motel. And part of this motel houses homeless people and the other part would house um, just weekly paying customers. And I was, I remember talking to this couple, African American lady and a white gentleman, older, just talking to him, passing the time as the you know, hours of the night went by, talking to him for about two weeks. And she would bring me out food and bring me out coffee, real nice people. And she had made the comment how she was really happy to be married to a Romine. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I asked her to repeat herself, and she goes, I'm really happy to be married to a Romine. And I looked at her, I'm like, well, that's my biological last name, is Jesse Fields Romine. And she looks at me, and she goes, you were adopted? I'm like, yeah. She goes, what was your dad's name? Now, I had never met him, never saw a picture of him, never, only, all I knew was his name. That was it. And, it, and I said it was Jerry, Jerry Lee Romine. She turns to this gentleman and says, hey, this might be your son you've been looking for all this time. Oh, and I look at her and I back up. Now I'm on the top level of this. Um, there's two stories to this place and I'm on the top level and I back up. He comes out. Hmm. I'll never forget. He says, uh, your mother's name was Lori, right? And I'm like, yeah, her name was Lorraine. And I backed up even farther. And he says, you had two sisters, right? I'm like, yeah. And by this time, I'm all the way to the back. And he's, I'm like, really starting to shake here. And he says, uh, when you were born, you had brain surgery. Yeah. He says, I'm your dad. Mm. Of all things in the world, of all the places. Now, I wasn't going to church at this time, so I wasn't praying, mm. but I was hoping all these years. And that was my biological father I'd never met, never saw a picture of, nothing. And I tell people that story because afterwards, 
I got to meet my grandmother and my aunt and my uncle. Now, I was always told that he wanted nothing to do with me and that that family wanted nothing to do with me. Complete false. Mm. Wow. I saw my grandmother, she brings out this baby book, has my pictures, has all of these things in it. I was so angry at my mother at the time for that. But so I tell people, don't rush to judgment when you, when you hear one side of the story, mm. because there's always three sides. Mm. That side, their side, and the right side. Yeah. And I'm so thankful to have met him. He has since passed away. He was heavy into drugs and alcohol. He has since passed away. But I got to meet the other side of who I was, mm. and that started a change in me. And <clears throat> I said, man, if that's possible, that I can meet this man out of the billions of people in the world at this very precise mo moment, then what else can I do? Wow. And Jesse, I'm going to pause you yeah. there because I want to, there's a piece of your story that I want to make sure that we get to, and it's really awesome. But you're going to have to wait because we're going to go to Carrie for a little bit. Um, say, we could just keep going. Uh, it's, it's incredible, Jesse. Um, but Carrie, I do want to hear from you on, because you said that your two of your kids had RAD, reactive attachment disorder, but it impacted one more significantly, right? Yes. So talk about Sam. Yeah, so um, his name isn't really Sam, but in public I call him Sam. And we adopted him from Vietnam when he was almost four. And we saw some things even on our trip over there that were a little bit concerning and called home and got a lot of guilt and shame and um, pressure, you know. So anyway, they had us convinced that, you know, we just need to get him home and everything will be fine. And so our other son, Brendan, we adopted um, at birth. We were at the hospital when he was born. So at the time Sam came, Brendan was eight. Our daughter, Katie, who is a biological daughter, was seven. And then here we brought this little almost four-year-old home. And we just kept thinking, if we just do the therapy that they're telling us, and if we just keep going, and it will settle in, it, it's going to happen. And we were driving an hour every week for therapy, and I had an attachment specialist. We were praying with our elders at our church. We had all the, th all the therapy lined up. And at one point, I remember saying to my husband, it looks like they're twins, like, they're acting so much the same, but they were born on opposite sides of the world, different cultures, different everything. Mm. But so much of what they were doing, you know, the crazy lying and the manipulation and some of that stuff. But one was way more severe than the other one. And some of the therapy that we were doing with our older son, it really was making a difference. But the younger son, it just... Didn't, we couldn't figure it out. We just couldn't get it to click. And, um, you know, like Jesse was saying, typically it's one way for mom and one way for dad. And, and that was absolutely true in our family. Um, he was super manipulative, mean, crazy, lying kind of stuff. Um, I remember learning the term gaslighting because I didn't know what that was. And I was like, oh, I've been gaslit. That, that's what's going on. You know, the red balloon. He would have me convinced that it really was purple and that I'm crazy. Mm. And so I was starting to doubt my sanity and uh, my marriage was falling apart. My family was falling apart. The other kids were not doing well. And I could see it would trigger the older son as well because he saw some of himself in that hmm. and really hated it because he didn't want to go that way. And once in a while when my younger one was acting up, the older one a couple times did something. I remember we drove home one time, got out of the car and there was that center pole in the, drive, in the garage and my older son got out and he opened the door harshly, didn't mean to, but he hit the pole and then he went, it made him mad, so he went boom, 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 three times into the pole with the door. Mm. Because he just, he just lost it mm -hmm. over that. So it would trigger him. Our whole family was triggered. Yeah. 
I don't know. It's not much of a story. <laughs> That's my reality. It's there you reality, go. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and I imagine some that are listening are living that reality as well. Um, you talked about how RAD can um, come out. You know, we've talked a few of these things, manipulation and lying, and how you said, Jesse, to it, they can believe you have yourself convinced. Not only are you trying to convince, and you can kind of be one person to in one way and I remember a mom sharing um, with me about their daughter who had rad or me, I don't think it was you but <laughs> there was, Maybe. it was a mom who said like all on the way to school her daughter I think it was her daughter would kick the seat and I hate you I hate you I hate you the whole way to school open the door I see all you. the friends I love you mom see ya yeah well the thing that I remember very well was I felt like I was walking a tight rope or a fence, and on one side was I needed to give a consequence or something for this behavior, because you can't just let it go. But on the other side, there were some um, limitations around different disabilities or whatever, and I didn't know where the line was. And so sometimes I would give a consequence or something and end up feeling really horrible because I didn't, I, I kind of came to realize maybe he really couldn't do it. Mm. But then there were other things that I would back off on and I'd get the look. And I mean, do you know the look? No. <laughs> <laughs> He'd give me the look. And I just knew I had been had. Mm. And I remember sitting in a therapist's office one time and she said, yeah, this is one of the biggest challenges, I think, because the kids know where the line is and you don't. Mm -hmm. And they'll use that to their advantage, you know. So it, it was just kind of crazy making in our family. And we wanted to help. We, you know, that was our heart. And we had already adopted once and it was going pretty well. And so then we bring this other little guy in and we... We just couldn't figure it out. You know, every year we're like, it's got to start getting better. It's, we've been putting in all this time and energy and special ed and all the, all the things. And we'd try different therapists. We had therapists come into our home. We just kept thinking, it has to get better. And, you know, here we are seven, eight years in, and we've got our child in the day psych treatment program at the hospital. And I'm thinking... It's not getting better, and in fact, we're all falling apart. Like, we're, we're not gonna make it. I don't know what to do here. So, I, you know, I hear Jesse's story, and what breaks my heart is knowing that the decision that I had to make added one more layer mm. for my son, and I know that, and we knew that going in. We knew as we were doing it, like, we're adding another layer of abandonment for him. And we would have done anything to not do that. And also, we really didn't have a choice at that point. And when did you know, when did you kind of come to terms with that this isn't working? It was several years in the making. Um, and because of the triangulation between my husband and I, we were on totally different pages. Mm -hmm. And uh, my husband was raised in an alcoholic home. And um, so for him, it was kind of like what you talked about with the chaos. When you get used to the chaos, you know, he just said, there's no other choice. You just live with it. What, what other option is there? There's not even a choice. And so I kept saying, we have to do something. I don't know what, but we have, something has to change. And you know, we placed our son in a new family in 2009. We had never heard of anybody doing that before. We had no idea you could do that. It, it wasn't even on our radar to be able to do this. So um, it came about because I was falling apart emotionally and psychologically. You know, I realized I had pretty severe PTSD and... Um, yeah, I just told my husband, you're going to end up a single dad, not because I'm leaving, but because I'm going to die. I could feel my body just shutting down, and I remember asking a psychiatrist once, can you catch anxiety? Because, like, I used to be a pretty calm person, but I was, like, twitchy and mm. <laughs> couldn't sleep and depressed and anxiety and all the stuff. And um, I remember when 
Michael Jackson died, they named off his meds, and I remember going, yikes, because <laughs> that was real similar to what I, I wasn't wow. being fed IV, but still, I, it was like, oh, that's a cocktail I'm familiar with, <laughs> hmm. just to help me sleep and function, and so I was not doing well, and so, yeah, that's, that's when it got to a place where I knew our, our other kids, really, so Sam was not functioning well in our home. Um, we were having to separate a lot. We were always dividing and conquering. It wasn't like we were a family. We considered even splitting our family to where my husband would take him and move into an apartment and I would stay with the kids and somehow we'd be a family, you know, um, which that's not a family and it's not feasible anyway. But we, we tried to think of every option. We were looking for... We had tried respite. We had uh, we didn't do boarding school or or residential mainly because we didn't know about it. But and God presented this family that yeah, just that. came out of the blue. So one night I was telling my husband, "You're going to be a single dad because I'm dying." So <laughs> good night. Yeah, um, good. And the next morning we walked into this um, consignment store that a friend of mine owned, and we had tried to sponsor them through an adoption a few years before, but she ended up pregnant with twins. So now here they are, and they've got these four little boys. She tells us they're ready to adopt a little girl. Or I, I said, is it a little girl? And she said, no, God's made it clear. It's a boy, he's local, and he's older. And I'm standing there, and I had just said this to my husband the, last, the night before. And it's like, what? <laughs> Mm. Who says that? What a weird thing to say, you know. <laughs> anyway, so they started taking our son for a day and then for a weekend, and the kids were doing well together, and it, it just, it was painful. It, it felt like our son was just moving into another family happily and joyfully, mm. and we're just sort of watching it happen. And, you know, I think it was kind of his honeymooning, and it was sort of him wanting to be in control of it too, because he really didn't want to be at our house. I do remember, though, this was super hard. Um, he had been there for a while, and I remember that it was, it was time. We needed to let him go. And as I was telling him and saying goodbye, he said, why do you only do the fun things with, and he named his siblings, and I said, well, sweetie, you know, we've done this and this and this. And I said, if you stay here, what, what do you want to do with mom and dad and Brendan and Katie? And he said, I want to play with Simon, who's this kid down the block. Okay, I know, but you'll still see Simon if you go to school. So if you stay here, what do you want to do with mom and dad and Brendan and Katie? And he just sat there. He couldn't think of one thing. So over those couple, it took about 15 months um, where he stayed with them and we gradually gave over guardianship and medical power of attorney and things like that so they could treat him. But as it was coming up toward the court date uh, in Colorado where we live, if kids are 12, they have a say in custody hearings. So they interviewed him because he was just going to turn 12. And they said, where do you want to stay? Do you want to stay where you're at or do you want to go back with the O'Toole's? And he said, I want to stay here. And they said, why? And, you know, I'm expecting to hear because I love them. They're my family. And he said, I'm a little less nervous here. Mm. And that was as good as he could do. He wanted to stay there because he was a little less nervous. So, and, you know, I just think his PTSD, he, I, I was his biggest trigger. Mm. So once he moved into his new home, he wasn't triggered quite as badly. And I think they were able to get some, some work done. His, his brain could function a little bit better. And, you know, when Jesse talked about being in the um, chaos, you know, our son came out, came out of this chaotic orphanage situation into our house, and we're a very quiet family. My other kids are readers, you know, we didn't have on a lot of noise or anything, and I could tell it drove him crazy. It was like his brain hurt mm. from being in our quiet house, so he would run around making noise and creating noise, and I remember after he left, my ears, like, ached because it was so quiet. Mm. Wow. 
You know, it's, it's easy for us as human beings looking on the outside of any story and making judgments, right? Did you experience that? Yes. Mm. Yeah, I, I felt like I was destroyed and grieving the deepest grief I had ever experienced. And um, there was no funeral. There was no, I lost my son. Um, there was no cards. There was no acknowledgement. Um, nobody brought casseroles or cleaned my house or anything. And in fact, we were judged very harshly. And the condemnation was pretty bad. And it was, I mean, there was some in your face. Um, but God was good. I, I prayed about certain people and just said, God, would you keep them away from me? <laughs> mm -hmm. Like until I'm healed up, just don't. There was one woman I remember I didn't. I lived like a mile from her, and I didn't see her for six years. Mm. And I just think that was God's <laughs> blessing <laughs> until I was healed up. Mm. You know, it's like God. I just need to heal up. This was. This is too much. Yeah. I had family members that I didn't speak to for several years because they just didn't understand and they blamed us. Mm. Yeah. It's. It's not the way it's supposed to be, is it? No. Right? No. It's, it's the brokenness, and it's hard, and I appreciate you honestly sharing. Um, I want to take us back to Jesse, because, Jesse, you talked about, um, I'll, I'll, I'll move the story along a little bit with you got married, but even for a few years into your marriage, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but a few years into your marriage, you didn't really feel like empathy really or like miss your wife or I mean talk about that and talk about what happened in 2019 yeah so I got married uh June 21st of 2003 um and to me at the time marriage was just acts of service right um I'll make I'll bring you dinner I'll I'll buy you this that's how I show what I thought was love I was not affectionate, didn't show any kind of affection, hated public affection, uh, very embarrassed by it. Um, and that went on for quite some time to where it created a lot of issues in our marriage to where my wife almost said, enough's enough, I'm gone, you know. Um, so that, that, that was hard for my wife. And to me, nothing was wrong. I didn't know any better. My wife was into praying quite a bit. Um, 2019, I go to bed one night, <clears throat> just how I am, and literally wake up the next morning looking at my wife as the most beautiful person I've ever seen in my entire life. Immediately, I feel all of her pain. I feel all of her anguish. I feel everything she's ever told me I was doing wrong. Um, I was overwhelmed with feelings I had never felt before. I had compassion, I had empathy, literally overnight. Um, and to this day, I love her more than anything in this world. I show her all the time, and it's because of her prayers that I was able to change that way. It's because of her prayers I was able to change that I have since given my life to God and in trying to help others do the same thing. I am a completely changed, different person than when I used to be. Mm. I wrote a book about my life growing up with the reactive attachment disorder and how I overcame. And now the second one is how I've even changed more than that. Um, and it's a blessing, 100% a blessing um, and to know that if I can do it, I know any, any, any of these kids going through this can do it. And that's what I offer is, is hope. Um, and an inside look of, of how to get that hope and that, that to achieve change, it is absolutely 100% possible, even more so um, by praying to do that. Mm. Yeah. And you even said it was actually, as it was so new, you felt kind of like a, a kid going through puberty. Oh, big time. Yeah, all these, all these new emotions that I've never experienced before were coming at me in all, all different directions. I didn't know how to um, figure them all out. And, and for the first couple months of that initial change, my, it was like a big roller coaster going like this. And my wife was freaking out. She didn't know how to handle everything. All of a sudden, she went from no affection to all this affection. 
And she was at that point telling me, back off, you know, you're being a little bit too much. I'm like, well, this is what you prayed for. And she goes, well, yeah, I guess. <clears throat> but since then, it has calmed down quite a bit. And um, I'm very, very blessed to be able to say where we're at now in our marriage. We, one, I never thought was possible. Mm. Two, she never thought was possible. And three is a place of, if you've ever heard of agape love, mm. that's the closest thing as I can compare it to on how we are right now. So coming from the abuse and neglect, the anger, the, the animal torture, all that to where I am now um, is just a huge blessing to be able to sit here with Carrie coming from the background she does of relinquishment and being able to understand why um, I think is a miracle on its own. So her and I working together are trying to change the outlook on people's minds um, and trying to help. And I'm back home in California. I'm trying to help different families look at it from a child's perspective so they can have a little bit better understanding and maybe a little bit. And I've gotten, you know, I've gotten emails and phone calls from all over the world. I tuck my children in more at night now. My child, I see my, my son or daughter differently. I give them extra kisses. They're doing better in school. They're, they're graduated when we didn't think they'd graduate. So a lot of positive stuff coming from it. Mm. That's so incredible. And that is a testimony to our faithful, faithful God. Um, we know it doesn't always work out that way. But it also does sometimes. Yep. And there is hope. And there's hope for Sam, right? Yeah. I mean, Jesse's story, the first time I interviewed him, I told him this, it felt like I was interviewing my son, mm. older, who was telling the truth. He'd answer my questions, and it helped me understand him better, and it gives me so much hope. And I, I constantly, you know, I coach other families who are going through what I did, and my prayer is always, God, do what you did for Jesse, mm. for these other kids. Rewire their brains overnight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just want to say, like, let's be people who walk alongside each other without judgment. There's enough of that in this world, enough shame, enough anger, unkindness. Let's be people who walk with each other, right? Absolutely. We're going we're gonna to wrap up our time, but I do want to give you both one last word. What, what do you want to share? What's on your heart as we close out? Uh, I would just say, you know, never lose hope. Never lose faith. Um, there's always hope. There's always people to help. Uh, if I can do it, trust me, any, anybody can do it. And I'm here if you want to talk afterwards. I'm here to try to help with that. Keep moving forward, don't give up. Thank you. And I would say there's healing after trauma. There's healing for you, for me, um, for my marriage, for my family. We're all doing really well. We know where Sam is. We know how he's doing. We keep tabs. Um, you know, it's, God's not done yet. It's a circle, and he's going to bring it around <laughs> at some point. I don't know how long it's going to take, but Jesse gives me hope that God can and will and does do it sometimes, and so that's what I just continue to pray for. Yeah, and go to carryotool.com if you'd like to learn more about our ministry and the coaching we do and the retreats, and we have podcasts and all kinds of resources out there to help if you're really struggling, and we'll both be around after. Yeah, and thank you both so, so much. We're better for this time with you. Let's Thanks give him a much. hand. Well, I hope that today's episode encouraged you wherever you are on your foster care journey. We want you to stay connected, so be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you will never miss an episode. Also, we have great content at theforgotteninitiative.org. Thank you for watching. I cannot wait to be with you next time.